Shelby County area. Um, she has a background in improvement nutrition, <laughs> and we're excited to announce that she has recently received her CCA accreditation. So, a big round of applause for Mary. <laughs> so, and today, Mary's going to be talking to us about fertilizer supply chain issues. So, here you go, Mary. Thanks, TJ. Hopefully, in our next meeting, we've been doing the same for TJ. So, once we find out that he definitely passed. His, uh, his CCA test. So it's been a fun, uh, fun season of studying in our office um, and, and quizzing each other. So um, for those that have taken the test, you know that it's a, a lot goes into it. So today we're going to talk about supply chain issues. I know we've had some challenging times this fall, um, heading into spring, and so we kind of wanted to hit at why. Why are we here? What are we seeing? So first slide. Let's see. Come on, very far. Too fast. All right. So I grabbed this chart here. This is 28 prices. All right. Is anybody tired of seeing these charts and be like, where is where is the ceiling on these charts? Does anybody feel that? <laughs> I remember, you know, looking back, we can see here in the June, July, we were pretty stagnant. I was like, okay, I think. I think we found the ceiling, like prices are high, but we can manage it, we found the ceiling. And what they do? They skyrocket it, right? Say, I apologize. Same for all of nitrogen, right? All of nitrogen is following this you know, excessive upward trend, and a lot of guys started talking last fall. Am I gonna be planting corn next year? Can we afford to fertilize our corn crop? And Rich mentioned it, he goes, the market sold that and started pushing that corn price up. So a lot of guys stopped talking, okay, I'm gonna plant soybean acres, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna plant our, car, our corn acres, but our nitrogen are still sky high. All right, we haven't seen this rapid of an increase ever. We have these spikes here, all right, we have a high spot in 2008, a high spot in 2012, all right, but we had gradual increases to get to those, to those prices. Not in 2022. These prices skyrocketed out of anybody, everybody I've talked to, like, we, it's, it's going to stop. It can't go any higher. It can't go this high this quick. But it did. And nitrogen isn't alone. Let's see if I can just get one. Or maybe. Our dryers are doing the same thing. DAP has increased $300 a ton. Math the same. And potash has increased $400 a ton since a year ago. All right, what is causing these price increases? Green. <laughs> green, okay. <laughs> a little bit of green. The answer is in the name of my presentation. Supply. Supply. The previous years when we had super high fertilizer prices, it was due to demand. Farmers kept applying it, they bought a lot of it, prices to go up. They fell on that greed side of things. These prices are truly a supply issue. All right? We look at potash prices, this looks at 2020, 21, and then the start of 22. Follows the same trend as those nitrogen prices. All right, but to really answer what's going on here, why are we seeing this major uptick in price? We have a supply issue, but what happened to our supply chain to make it break down? COVID. All right, a lot of times the answer is COVID, right? We have supply of shortages of staff. All right, but what happened pre-COVID? Does anybody here remember 2019 or beyond? It took me a long time to be like, what happened? I was like, I just need to back to my past with COVID. Everything, you know, before that, it's everything happened because of COVID. Everything happened because of COVID. But we were actually setting ourselves up for the supply chain malfunction or breakdown before COVID even happened. So if we look at 
This slide. This pulls in the 2019 fertilizer prices number, fertilizer prices for potash. All right, we see there in the purple, they were pretty high. What else was happening in 2019? We have high fertilizer prices. We had a trade war. What did that do to our commodity prices? Rich showed them earlier, we had a pretty low lull there for a few years in the late uh, part of that decade. All right, so we had low commodity prices and high fertilizer prices. So what were you guys doing? Were you applying a lot of fertilizer trying to build up your levels? No. We were trying to get by, we were trying to save money because the commodity prices weren't there to support it. We were doing what we can. It was the same thing for our chemistries, our equipment. We were just trying to get by until commodity prices got better, right? Well, then what happened in 2020 besides COVID? The price here of potash and all of our fertilizers follow the same trend. I just pulled one up on the screen. Our price of potash that fall of 2020 went down. Commodity prices started rebounding and we got an influx of cash from the government. So what did you guys do? You guys put fertilizer down. And we put fertilizer down in the masses, all right? It was cheap, commodity prices supported it. We started pulling out that supply that was in the system at a faster rate than we can bring it back because of COVID. COVID did have supply shortages because of our staffing, our factories, trucking, shipping costs, all right? So that did play a factor into it, but we pulled that supply down because fertilizer was cheap, prices supported it. We never thought we would be at this point, we're still, we're struggling with the supply chain. And right now, we're trying to just get by. We've got the supply there, we can keep up with demand if we don't have any hiccups. All right, there's no flex in the supply chain for those hiccups to occur. But what happened in 2021? We had some hiccups. It was kind of the perfect storm for fertilizer. We talk about nitrogen, all right? We had two big events down south that stopped fertilizer production. We had the polar vortex that went through with that extreme cold down in Texas and Louisiana, froze water pipes, shut off electricity, or shut down electricity grids. Those plants couldn't run. So we're already on a tight ship with our supply, and we can't, we're down for weeks, cannot be, not be able to make any more. All right, and then the fall, Hurricane Ida came in and shut those plants down again. So it's kind of the perfect storm is we're pretty tight on what we can make, and we're getting hit with these environmental disasters that are shutting down our plants. Just recently, there were four plants in the Caribbean that were shut down because of, they had no power. Their power plant went down, and so that was where a lot of NH3 was coming out, so we saw that spike in our NH3 prices. These are all kind of accumulating to that perfect storm that we kind of set up for ourselves because we put a lot of fertilizer on when we could afford it. And the same thing's happening, happening in the chemistries and the equipment. So again, we saw that they were stretched. We did required maintenance, but maybe we didn't upgrade. Well, then we got that influx of cash, we could upgrade, but then we had our chip shortage because we couldn't get those chips or we couldn't get some of that raw material over due to COVID. And we're still seeing a lot of those uh, transportation issues happening today. And I've heard a lot of people say, you know, well, what if we just built, you know, infrastructure in America to be able to make all this raw material for any step that we need? But that's not physically possible. There's still a lot of material overseas that we have to import in order to create those chips, in order to create the materials that we need. And so, unfortunately, we're still kind of stuck in this middle where we still have to rely on importing all some of our raw goods in order to create some of our uh, products that we need. Same thing's happen happening on the chemistry side. So a lot of the uh, chemistry companies were trying to cut down on their, on their supply, all right? The low commodity prices made storing a lot of those chemistries, a lot of those chemicals, not favorable to their financial institutes. And so they're like, okay, you need to bear down on these supplies, get rid of these, get them out the door. Well, then 2019 hit. Does anybody remember what we did in 2019? Was it a good planting year? A bad 
planting year? It was bad. We had a record number of prevent plant acres. And so these chemical companies were like, oh no, we need to back off of production, slow down production, because we're not able to get what we've gotten out the door. And then again, COVID hit. And so when we needed to ramp up production, we physically couldn't. Factories had to shut down. We had to supply uh, the worker shortages. And so that's all accumulating into this perfect storm of where we're at today and why we're seeing some of these crises. Now, like, like Bridge said, thankfully, the markets are trying to help you know, go in an upward direction to help us be able to afford being able to plant a crop this year. And so if you can market correctly and get yourself locked into a price where you know your cost, you know your expenses, you know what your predicted income is, you can, you know, put, you know, ride this wave of these high prices. All right, but are we stuck here? Are we gonna last in this, you know, tight supply forever? <clears throat> Historically not. Historically not. All right. That's what the supply and demand curve does. All right. We build up supply. We have to use it down. We bring it back down. It takes a minute to shake out and shift out. But that's what the industries are doing. They're trying to build more efficient ways to get the product out, get the product in, all right, and to farmers. But one of the things that, especially on the chemistry side, has been challenging, I was reading, is that they don't really know how much product is out there. So they don't know how much to make. So typically at the end of the year, you have unused product, you return it. All right, how many people held on to their chemistries, their chemicals after last year because they're like, I don't know if I can get this, I'm holding on, I'm not gonna, I don't, I'd rather have the chemical versus the cash in my hand. Anybody? Yeah. Nobody wants to admit it, but they're hold, you're holding on to some chemistries out there because Everybody knew going into the fall, we didn't know if we were going to be able to get our hands on it. All right, so the, the companies are trying to, you know, predict production, where production needs to be, and they're having a hard time doing that right now because they don't know exactly what's out there. All right, so they can't really predict how much to create. They don't know how much is you know, going to be sold, and they don't want to get into the, to the same cycle again where they've got a bunch, they need to try to, to liquidate their supply and kind of start this all over again. So it is some challenges. Thankfully, we're not stuck here. We will ride this storm. You know, I can't tell you how many years it'll be. I wish I could. I wish I had that magic ball. I tell that to guys all the time. If I had a magic ball, I definitely wouldn't be standing in front of you guys. But we won't be stuck here forever. This will shake out. Things are already opening up more at the ports. We're getting more goods in. All right. And so we're getting some of these kinks worked out um, to where you know, we will see a decrease. I'm not saying this year, maybe, hopefully next year in prices. Um, so Danny is gonna talk about, okay, we have these supply chain issues, all right? We have, you talk to your retailer, like, hey, I don't know if I can get all of what you need. How do you manage that plan going forward? All right. So good luck with the clicker. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> if it works, let's see. All right, let's see. So first of all, I want to just acknowledge some of the things that we have as areas of concern. You all know these, this isn't anything, I'm just acknowledging that these are out there. The cost and availability of several items. Um, yeah, it's slow. So, why is, that's, yeah. Do we, do you want to grab one of those batteries and see if you can do it? And Bethany, are you back here? Well, you just click on to the, go ahead and finish that list there. For, so, um, fertilizer, ag chemicals, cost and availability of those, equipment, machinery, seed, fuel, labor, operating funds. Can you get your, um, your operating line to make sure that you can get your crop out? On the grain marketing side, go ahead and click some more. Do you have a grain marketing plan for contracting? Um, I mean, basically, do you, you know, we've got the, the expense side. Are you going to be able to get anything on the, on the grain marketing side? And do you have a risk management plan? These are some concerns I think that every, a lot of these, a lot of people have. And, and on land costs, does your rent agreement make sense in a year like this? Oh. <laughs> so, okay. Good. Thank you. Yes, that works. Thank you. Okay, so what is your 2022 goal? Um, 
there's several people in this room that you, I, I think we've got the full range within this room. So are you in survival mode? Or is your focus on maximum economic return? We'll talk a little bit about this as well. Are you somewhere just a little bit beyond economic return where you're looking for high yield but good economics? Or is your focus on high yield specifically? And it might be if you've got good contracts and you want to make sure you've got them filled as much as you can. I mean, that might be your focus. Let's, let's fill the bins. Let's, uh, let's sell what we can. But where, you know, think about just where do you stand in this line? What, what, what point are you at and where do you want to be at? And is this the year to, to move back over to uh, maybe the, that maximum economic return a little bit from the, the maximum yield with some of the input prices that you have? Maybe you bought right, so you are down in this area where your, tr your focus is, uh, you know, your maximum e economic return might be different than somebody else's. So uh, anybody know what this is? It's a curve. It's a curve. There you go. So the law of... Diminishing returns for each, whoops, that was, that was me, for each unit of input, additional unit of input, you've got less additional units of output. And that's the way fertilizer works, that's the way so many things in life work, the law of diminishing returns. Looking at it another way, uh, this shows that this very first piece is your most productive, your very first unit of input that you put in there. But as you get to a certain point, you hit a point of maximum yield, and then it starts, it can start going negative. You, but you're, there's a point there that it starts getting less and less that you, you just need to be aware of. And I'll, I'll come back to this, actually talk a little bit more about it on this next. Purdue uh, puts out an, a study, a plant, corn plant population study, over a number of years, about a dozen years that they use that, 83 field scale trial uh, field scale population trials that they did. This was conducted by Bob Nielsen, Jim Camerato, and Dan Quinn is helping them uh, get this information out right now. He's repackaging it. He's uh, Dan Quinn is Bob Nielsen's um, essentially replacement as the extension corn state extension corn uh, specialist. Um, so let's talk about agronomic optimum plant population. And what this is showing is around 32,000, that's of, of that 83 trials that we talked about, that's the uh, point on average where you had your highest yield come off of it. With, we're at about 32,000. Now that's, since it's over uh, several trials, there's some that are gonna be you know, farther down the list, some of back over this way. But this is what the, what the data shows. And if we take just this top 20%, and we're gonna zoom in on it a little bit, we're gonna show what that information tells us. So I know this isn't soil fertility, but on this, it, the, the concepts will work with that as well. But what you're seeing here, there's a, a few things that come to mind. Um, this curve again, again, this is just from 80 to 100, so we're looking at that top 20%. About 32,000 final stand population. So you're planting, say if you have a 95% germination, uh, then you might have a 5% loss. So you'd have to divide that by 0.95, it'll get you about another 1,500 out here to, for planting. But basically at 32,000, that's where you, you max out on yield. However, if you look at five dollar seed and two fifty or sorry two hundred and fifty dollar seed cost, then what they're suggesting with that is about twenty seven thousand two fifty is your maximum economic optimum plant population. Now, is that everywhere in every field? No. No. This is what they averaged across all of these across the state of Indiana. So, you know, there's a lot of things to keep in mind here, but one other point that I see here, your, your yield or your economics go down as you increase on your, uh, on your populations to, to a certain point. So, you know, you don't wanna keep spending where it's not giving you a return. So let's 
And I'm not saying that we shouldn't put out 32,000 or more. Now, this is what the plant populations have maximized return to seed relative to grain price and seed cost. So does any one thing grab you in that table? This is the maximum economics final stand population. What grabs your attention there? What number do you not see? 30,000. That's right. That's the one that surprised me the most. And this is, again, this is produced data. I don't see a 30,000 there. But if you take $6 corn, $2.50 on seed price, 28,000 is where it became most economic. Now, this, again, across a lot of environments. But there's some pieces just to think about. So this would be about 95 or, sorry, this would be 95 percent. If you divide it by the 28,000 by that, it would give you about 29,500 something. So roughly. So you can take the same concept and use it on maximum return to nitrogen relative to grain price and nitrogen cost. And it's the same guys that were doing the study. This is central Indiana's data looking at a similar table to what we just saw. This is using nitrogen cost, grain price. And but this is the amount of nitrogen applied per acre. Looking at this. And one of the things you'll notice here also is that as your nitrogen cost increases, your amount of nitrogen decreases as far as the economics of it. This is the economic optimum nitrogen rate, essentially. So no surprises here. Now, this is central Indiana. Does this apply to this group? You don't know. There's a lot of things you don't know about this. So I'm going to just show you just a little bit more. By the way, so with about 90 cent nitrogen, we're talking about 192 is the economic optimum for central Indiana. The way they did the research, you have 23 central Indiana trials. The agronomic optimum nitrogen value is 232 pounds. So basically the highest yield was at 232 pounds of nitrogen per acre. This is the map that they broke the state down into on these central Indiana trials. You can see that central Indiana really, there's a lot of up in some really nice, loamy, high yielding soils in northern Indiana. But central Indiana here also includes some areas to the south that may not perform the same or have the same weather as you have in the other parts of central Indiana. So you've got to keep everything, think about it with a grain of salt. So there's an economic optimum nitrogen rate. Dan Quinn, in some of his research and in a recent interview, suggested it will normally be about 20 to 30 units less than the agronomic optimum or the highest yielding spot. Hope that makes sense. Okay, so now let's get more to the soil fertility on potassium and phosphorus. So there are two components that green crop consulting, other agronomic consultants look at quite often, primarily whenever you're trying to make a fertilizer recommendation. Two components that we need to know. Anybody know what those are? On phosphorus and potassium, what do you need to know? Oh, come on, this is basic. Soil test. Okay, so let's start with that. Nutrients in the soil. Soil test information is what's going to help us get there. We need to know where we're starting. John talked about where are we and where are we going. The other piece is yield goal. What's your yield goal? We want to know where are we, what's the phosphorus level, what's the potassium level, and then the second part is the yield goal. What are we trying to produce? What is our outlook for the next couple of years? Where are we trying to go with this? And I put it in another term that you might be, it might hit home just a little bit more. How much gas do you have in your tank? And where are you going? 
How far is it to your destination? If you know those two things, then we can come up with a recommendation that's going to help you get there. But yeah, how much gas do you have in your tank? Where are you headed? How much? How long is it going to take you to get to your destination? If you if you don't have much, then you may not reach that destination that you're hoping for. If you've got enough, you may not need to add more to your tank to get there. Okay, phosphorus and potassium fertilizer recommendations. Here's some just some other considerations that we typically have because we're making a recommendation. Whoops. Uh, pH. You know, John mentioned calcium and magnesium. This is this is near the top of my list. And pH. We want to know our, is our is our pH in balance? Are we in the right area? Our calcium and magnesium. If we don't have the right soil structure, then what we're not going to be able to do. I mean, this is going to. If we don't have that in place, we're going to limit our yield. We're not going to be able to get to where we're going to go. We're going to be inefficient with our nitrogen and other nutrients. Corn or soybeans, you know, what's our plan going forward? Are we, what's our second year crop of the two? What's our first year crop of the two? Are we fertilizing each crop or every two years? Just some things that we need to know. Whoops, we jumped in a couple. Flat rate, are we gonna are we gonna hold one of the two years as a flat rate so that we can add micronutrients to the list and get them applied and still variable rate the other years so that we that's what we do quite often. Um, has re manure been used recently and can we uh, credit any additional for that manure? Okay. What is your exchange capacity? As John mentioned before, that's a very important piece of that as well. Um, if, it's, if you're on a sandy soil, you may need to apply every year. Uh, do you have the equipment to variable rate apply or what is the equipment that the ag retailer is going to use? So these are questions, again, that we're asking so we can make sure that we get the right recommenda recommendation out to be used in the equipment that is uh, <coughs> set up for, for use. Planter set up for starter. Do you know, you know, how much are you putting any phosphorus through the planter? We want to know that. Um, and is it is it just a little bit in furrow or is it two by two and you're putting uh, how many gallons out? Um, and when we can help you with that. But long term plan. Basically, do you have this land? Uh, you got it sewn up, you know you're going to be farming it for 10 or more years, or is it this uh, short term going to uh, warehouses or something like that? We, we see that. Uh, and are you on a limited input budget? If, if, if so, and we need to put some limits on there, we want to make sure that we know where those should be. We want to, we want to help you come up with a recommendation that's going to work for you based on your yield goals. And, and everything that we do, we're going to be utilizing the four R's of nutrient stewardship. And those are the right rate, right source, right time, and the right place, placement of that nutrient. Okay, so my summary, uh, consider the law of diminishing returns. Recognize that the curve has shifted and it always shifts every year based on input costs, based on uh, the, the Price of grain that you're expecting at the end of the year, if you can lock some of that in, you've got a better idea of where you're going. Consider the economic optimum and agronomic optimum returns. And these are some things that we'd be glad to talk with you about and, and try to help understand where you're headed and what we can do. Focus on cost-effective business decisions for 2022. Actually, the, the thing is, right now, if you may have bought well, and you've got some really good potential this year with some reasonable prices. There might be a lot of potential for you this year. It might be next year that you're more concerned about whenever maybe commodity price declines and some of these input costs stay up. And, and that's, you know, just need to be aware of, of what you're thinking long term and, and just help you, we'll help you plan with that. Focus on the greatest yield limiting factors that are in your control. Again, what is one of the greatest yield, limiting yield factors is knowing where your soil test levels are and then starting from that point of knowledge and working forward. And then we must, well that's what I just said, you must know your levels before cutting fertilizer applications. If money's tight this year and you know you want to cut, 
cut in the right place. Make sure, you know, don't cut where, where it's going to limit your yield, but cut where you're going to have the least negative impact on yield. If, if your fertility is high, you can reduce fertilizer input with little impact on yield. If your fertility is low on phosphorus, phosphorus or potassium, to get that yield that you're looking for, you're going to have to make a minimum application or you're going to have to somehow support that crop. And so that's that's what I had. And John, you, you want me to switch, Dan? Yep. Yep. Do you have any, any questions on the soil fertility side? Please? Okay. We're going to get John over here to talk a little bit about nitrogen rates uh, and talk with us Are we about that. Nitrogen rates or nitrogen stabilizers? Uh, either or both. So let's start with stabilizers. And then okay. Do we need to do anything different here? Okay. Danny, what's your favorite number? Favorite number? Oh, I don't have one. Danny, what's your favorite number? Um, I think it's two. Two. I, I think it's two. Look at the pink. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I think it's two. Here we are. Two, 22, 22. That's a lot. All right, so. There you go. Don't go Keep it up here. Close. Don't, don't go anywhere. Okay. Don't go too far. Okay. All right. So, so I want to talk about. So, Danny, I think the reason you asked me to, to bring up the SIG trial data. Yes. Is because you're trying to, to say if I utilize a stabilizer, can yes. I be more conservative on my nitrogen rates? We've had the quest. Yes. We've had questions. People have been asking about what do we do with nitrogen rates this year, and and uh, we want to get some answers. Some at least some information out so that you can uh, help come up with your own answers on, on the stabilizer. Uh, and, and we know that we have we have a participant in the in these trials, and uh, we appreciate that. But anyhow, we're trying to work within the uh, Amplify system and and come up with uh, assist in, in getting some of those those uh, answers to the questions that are out there. And, and so what, what I'm going to share with you quickly, because I think I've only got like 10 minutes or so, right? Yeah. Or less. No, go, go, we want this one. We want, we want to make sure we talk about this. Okay. So uh, as a group, and that you don't have to stand up here if you're uncomfortable standing up there. Um, as a group, uh, we went after a SIG grant. Does anybody know what SIG is? It's a Conservation Innovation Grant, and it's a U USDA NRCS grant that allows you to um, come up with innovative ways to look at different processes and different, different uh, systems. And <clears throat> because of the Nutrient Star program and what we did and, and the, some of the people that participate um, in terms of the scientific community, we were able to, to get a SIG grant in 2019. And in 2020, 21, and 22, we're actually looking at nitrogen stabilizers um, and Danny said there's somebody in the room probably who helped produce some of the information that's here. Um, but we, we basically need, we in the grant we've, we've told the NRCS that we would produce 150 field scale trials on nitrogen stabilizers. <clears throat> and what I'm going to do, I'll, I'll cut to the chase, there's a 50-50 chance that stabilizers, if you reduce your rate to 75% of the side risk, that there's a 50-50 chance that you can do exactly the same as you did with your with your normal side dress rate. But what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about the aggregate data. Why? Why am I going to spend a little time telling you about nitrogen stabilizers? Why am I going to spend a little bit of time talking about how we collected the data? What did I tell you about the last time I stood up here and talked about aggregate data sets? <laughs> Absolutely. I, I want to tell you about stabilizers because it, you, an alternative may be uh, to utilize that in place of, of pounds, for sure. But it, it comes back to, if you don't have a foundation understanding of, of what went into the data that I showed you, if I, all I did was step up here and show you that 50-50, you might say, well, what is he not showing me? And I, so I want to take a minute and talk about it, okay? So basically we had, in 2020, we had 53 field trials. Each one of the pins that's up there was, was one of our trials, and, and those are the people on the on the left-hand side of the slide, those are the consulting groups that helped us produce uh, uh, the trials. 
Uh, here's our 21 trials. Notice, notice guys, that were heavily, were heavily uh, placed in both years in uh, Indiana, Ohio. This is where a majority of our consulting businesses are, uh, Indiana, Ohio. And so again, that's good. the weather. Think about the weather, because that plays a big factor in nitrogen stabilizers. Our design, our design this year in 21 had four treatments. Last year, we only had three. This year we went farmer normal rate, cygress, normal cygress rate. We went farmer normal rate, cygress rate, plus a stabilizer. We went 75% of the cygress rate, and then 75% of the rate treated. And the five products that we were looking at were Anvil, Centuro, Instinct 2, NSERV, and BDN Trust. BDN Trust is a biological, it's a little bit of a different pro product up there, but because there was so much interest in, by our participants in having some kind of a biological, we went ahead and put one into the grant. Um, so what do they do? Anvil is a urease inhibitor. What does that mean? Urease. Whenever you apply urea, that urease enzyme works in the soil to break down that urea before it goes into the soil and, and gas it off as, as ammonia. So what urease does is it slows down that enzyme. What, what's the limiter, what's, what's the big limiter on urease? If I go out and I, I weed and feed, right? UAN, UAN is 50% urea. Whatever the nitrogen pounds that you're applying, 50% of those are in the urea form. If I weed and feed an application and I get a rainfall 20 minutes after I leave the field, does that urease uh, inhibitor have a chance to work? No. Not a bit, right? Because that rain took that urea right into the soil, converted it to ammonia, hooked onto the soil, and, and away you go. So that, that's one clue of what, what I'm about to show you is one of the moving factors is in these stabilizers is weather plays a huge factor in whether or not they have an opportunity to show uh, to, to have to to, um, to perform. Centuro is a nitrification inhibitor. What does that mean? What does a nitrification inhibitor do? Slows down the conversion from ammonia to nitrate. Why is that important? When you think about the charges of the soil, soil is negatively charged. That's the exchange capacity we talked about. Ammonia. Does anybody know the charge on ammonia? Well, ammonium is positively charged, so it will stick to the soil, right? When uh, uh, the biology in the soil work on that ammonium, it replaces the hydrogen with an oxygen, which makes nitrate. Nitrate is negatively charged. When I take a negative magnet, side of a magnet, and I try to push it to the negative side of a magnet, what do they do? They push away from each other. So when that up nitrate is negatively charged, it'll move through the soil because it can't grab onto the, the soil colloid and stay there. So nitrification inhibitors slow down the conversion from ammonia to nitrate, therefore hopefully, hoping to get it to stay in the soil. So what does it take? What does it take to lose that nitrate in the soil? It goes back to rainfall. If you get two inches of rainfall within a couple of weeks of the application, that nitrification inhibitor has an opportunity to show. If you don't get that couple of inches within 12 to 14 days, the nitrification inhibitor probably wasn't needed. So again, I'm telling you the moving parts of these trials because you're gonna say 50-50 chance? Are you kidding me? But because of all the complexity that went into these trials, uh, Tom Morris, who's, our, who's one of our scientific advisors, said, I never want to do another nitrogen stabilizer as long as I was trial, as long as I live. Just because of all the variables that he's trying to manage in his head and decide, if, am I looking at real data or not? <clears throat> and then instinct nitrification inhibitor, NSERV is a nitrification inhibitor, then the BD and trust. So you talk to the companies uh, of the biologicals that are being marketed as nitrification inhibitor or uh, stabilizers, what they're talking about is their biology goes out and makes the, the nitrogen part of itself. So it basically eats the nitrogen and makes it part of its, its, its organism. It has to die in order to get that nitrogen back out. So keep that in mind that, that a biological stabilizer, basically you've got to kill the microbe in order to get the nitrogen back that it took up. Okay. Um, I, I, I just talked about this. The, the, where, do, where do inhibitors have the biggest opportunity to, to perform? It's on the extremes. It's the sandy soil and the wet soil, basically. 
So if you want to see where a stabilizer has an opportunity to really perform, pick some, pick some tough areas. And that's what I think we see in our data set when we break it down that way. It's sandy soils because of that low exchange capacity, you, you have a chance to, to leach, uh, or it goes anaerobic in, in, the, in, the, um, in the heavier soils. Uh, and we've already talked about this. I just said 22 inches within 24, uh, within 48 hours. So that means you've got to get 22 inches within two days in the first two weeks after application in order to really see a nitrification in heavier work. Um, and then you lose it by leaching with the same kinds of, um, uh, the same kinds of conditions. When we produce information back, we're producing graphs. So, so the cooperator in the room, Dan, is probably familiar with, with these pages. But I wanted to show it. Because what's the idea? We talked about the idea that if you have an individual trial, you can then compare to an aggregate data set and see if your results match up to the group results. And, and so that's what we do. We try to produce a report that we can sit in a room, show the aggregate data, and, and then come back and, and they can compare themselves, ask questions amongst the group. So um, I'm going to show you some, I'm gonna, all, <clears throat> all the graphs I'm going to show you are economics. It's based on $5 corn and 80, 80 cent nitrogen. Uh, and then the stabilizer itself was calculated for the, for the price of each one of those stabilizers. So the, we're trying to show economics more than we are yielding. And the reason that is is because it goes back to your slide of are you trying to produce maximum yield or are you trying to produce maximum profit? And I think most of the time it comes back to profit. Okay. Um, so the data suggests, and this is why Tom doesn't want to do stabilizer trials anymore, is that we are not limiting the nitrogen enough. I'll just let the cat out of the bag that 75 percent, cutting, cutting the rate of sidegrass nitrogen to 75 percent is not removing enough pounds for the stabilizer to pop out and show what it's protecting. And I think that's because probably the nitrogen programs themselves are, have some of that, uh, that the higher t the higher nitrogen rates to begin with, and then rainfall timing. We got we kind of got to be in the right place at the right time to catch the rainfall, and, and then the quantity itself. Again, think about that two inches over forty eight hours. Having having that happen, there's not very many trials of the hundred that I'm going to show you where where all of these things were met. But this is in in a, in a nutshell. Um, this is is the cumulative data for two years. What it shows. Again, when anybody ever puts a graph in front of you, let's, let's pay attention. What are the red bars? What do the red bars represent? Individual fields. Okay? So those are individual fields. We have, what, 100, we have 93 trials up there. So there's 93 red bars. That means we've got 93 trials over the course of two years. What is the magnitude over here on the on the y-axis, money, it's basically the economic return, okay? Economic return of taking the farmer normal rate minus the 75% treated rate. Because that's the, that's the question that we're, that we're trying to answer is, can you reduce your nitrogen side rest rate 25% at a stabilizer and make money? So knowing that, knowing that the magnitude of those bars is, is the amount of money that's made by adding that stabilizer, what, what's your answer to should you do it or not? Okay, let's look at this. On this side, the farmer rate lost dollars compared to the 75% treated, right? So basically, cutting the rate, the, the, reducing the rate 25%, that money that was saved, it was more than the farmer normal rate, okay? On this side, the farmer normal rate was higher than the 75 treated. And when you look at the percentages, 49 of the 93 trials, farmer normal rate had a higher return to end for a 53% win rate. But 49% of the time, the 75% treated one. So what does that tell you? 
What's that? It was a 50-50. What does that tell you? You got a quarter in the Right? Flip a coin. Flip a coin. But why? Well, looking at the data, you, you really have more area in the red on the right than you do on the left. Right. The magnitude also plays an effect, is what is what you're saying. Right. You're seeing more red when you look at it under a volume percentage or a volume that there's that this magnitude is also important, right? How much did it win by? And you're right. So so let me ask you a question. Do you think, because I'm going to show you a data set here in a minute, aren't I, Danny, where, where there's 100 and some odd trials, 150 trials over the course of three years of nitrogen rate trials, where the same people that did these stabilizer trials for three years of 16, 17, and 18, we tried to hone in nitrogen rates for guys. Those same guys did these trials. What does that tell you about their nitrogen rates to begin with? They were pretty doggone close. Pretty doggone close to where they needed to be so they weren't over applying in. And I think that's why you're seeing more red on this side because the farmer, when it needed it, it needed it. It needed those extra pounds and the stabilizer itself couldn't make up those extra pounds. I agree. I agree. There's more red. And the magnitude's important. But Danny, I think there is opportunity based on this to reduce nitrogen rates, add a stabilizer, and see what happens. Am I telling you to do that on every acre? <coughs> if, if I did, you should basically tie my hands together, put me in the truck, and send me back to Northwest Ohio. What I'm telling you is there's opportunity for, out, for you to go out and learn in your environment, in your Brookston Crosby, to see if this nitrogen stabilizer pattern holds true in your operation. And Danny, I looked at, I looked at the, the data from the individual trials for here and then on the other side of Indy. And, and the BDN Trust, what I saw this year, I don't think the BDN Trust gave the nitrogen back in time for the crop to get it. The stabilizer, the instinct, or the, I think it was instinct that happened up there, the, the nitrification inhibitor, um, it showed that um, it, it performed. So it, it had an opportunity based on rainfall. And you guys must have had a drought this year a little bit. We, we were wet early and then, uh, or mid-season, and then we were dry later on, yes. Yep, yep, and that's what I, that's what I thought I saw in some of the data. So it wasn't optimal conditions no. for, for and, and using the BDN trust, that, there's a little bit of mystery there, guys. That whole biological thing isn't all that well understood. So take, take biologicals with a little bit of grain of salt at this time. That's my advice based on what I see in the data. Um, <clears throat> rainfall, we're, we're really trying to quantify rainfall spatially. We're trying to understand on a trial by trial basis using radar adjusted rainfall uh, to come back. And, and we're gonna have a much better result or much better data set analysis done after this year. This will be our last year uh, of trial of data collection, so the scientists will spend more data or more time on the data analysis. Um, but, but again, <clears throat> I think this is your decision point. Nitrogen is expensive right now. Uh, can, it, can it help offset the cost of that stabilizer? I think there's a 50-50 chance that, that it is, and I think you guys um, have the opportunity to maybe show that yourself. Um, I think that's it. Oh yeah, sorry. Okay. On your data set there with the returns. Yep. Do you have anything that maps the soil CEC to each side of the <laughs> Boom! <laughs> the question was, can you show me of the 93 trials there, what if you break it out by exchange capacity, does it show the same pattern? Can you show? Because didn't I tell you? Light exchange is one is opportunity. Heavy exchange is an opportunity. High, high organic matter, potentially. Uh, low organic matter, potentially, is opportunity. Boom. That's how, that's how you have to think. You're right. It's buried in there. The exchange capacities of those fields is all buried in that data set. How about tillage? How about um, planting date? How about nitrogen rate? Yeah, the 
Every How about rainfall over the field? Rainfall timing. That's and that's why I showed this because timing we talked about being important. That is the opportunity. Is can you collect enough data and then have the supporting data or the metadata to come back and say I only want to see between this and this. And I'm going to show you something like that in a minute on this hopefully the nitrogen rates. But 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 that's a great question. The answer is can we get it? Yes. Did we do it that way? No. But we're trying. Great question. Great great thought process. Yeah. Um, we're seeing more and more need for sulfur. I've been told, and is there any truth that sulfur will act as a nitrogen stabilizer? So I don't. As a as a as a scientist, I gotta say I don't know. But I have heard that yes, the sulfur in there has some effect on the microbiology that affects uh, the, the transformation of, of each of those. Um, that, that nitrification process, I think, is the main one that it affects. So yes, but I don't know of any research, Danny, or I don't know of any research. I, I know it's been done about no, the... Jim Camber, let's see. Sorry, Scott. Yep, there you go. And that's that's the data, that's the research that I didn't know how to wrap, or didn't know. Yeah. No, I, I know this Jim Camberato, I've, I've heard him, and he's produced uh, extension fertility specialist. He's talked about um, ammonium thiosulfate, for instance, being a, a weak stabilizer of nitrogen. And it does, it does help out a little bit. Ammon the other uh, sulfurs can, but they have to be worked in conjunction. And, Basically, your, your plant will utilize nitrogen more efficiently if it's got the right sulfur balance with it, too. So there's, there's a lot there, and you're, you're talking about it right. But it, as far as it stabilizing, it won't do much. It won't, compared to these, it's not going to be quite as good, but it's gonna, it will help some in stabilizing that nitrogen. That's a great question, because there's a lot of people that are using sulfur, and they're getting that added benefit. The, pl the plant needs it anyways. Okay. Yep. Yep. Got it. In those trials, they use full rates and in terms of based on the Yeah, that's a great, great question, right? Because we asked them to cut rate and and what happened to the stabilizer. What we did, because because listen, if we're if we're pre mixing the product into the into the um, nitrogen, and then we go out and, and we cut rate, we did it. What we ended up doing is the full rate of the seventy five. So we were actually over applying. Uh, at a full farmer rate. We wanted to give them the best shape possible. But that's a, you guys are thinking spot on. What are you, what are you hiding in your data? And that's great. And I'm not really trying to hide, I'm just saying that, that those are the kinds of things that I could have come up here and said, 50-50 chance, I'm out of here, right? But talking about it, hopefully you're gonna walk out of here learning a little more uh, about number one, the, the trials that we're doing, and then number two, the stabilizing. Yeah. John and Boyer are saying if, if you can pick this apart and you think you have a condition on your farm that might, the stabilizer might work, then it makes sense to try it. Is that what you're saying? Uh, that, so yeah, Tom just said, based on the data set that's here, <laughs> high, high exchange, low exchange, you know, conditions where the stabilizer may work, should, should you guys try it? Absolutely, Tom. Absolutely, I, and I think leave some strips that are unchecked, right, or that, that are untreated, so that so that you can come back and, and be able to uh, to analyze that. And what what we're asking, what we have, guys are doing for these trials is they go in with the um, untreated tank, but they leave some strips, and then they come back, put the treatment in, fill in the strips. That's that's mainly how probably how most of these guys are doing. And and we're looking for more cooperators, Danny. Yep. So, so we'll, if you guys want to do the strips, we'll, we'll provide the product, we'll provide the, uh, the analysis. Um, if you guys will do, we'll do the field work and we'll pay you. We've got, we've got money in the grant to pay cooperators. Yep. I know you said you don't really know, but does sulfur timing play, have a play into so putting sulfur on a row starter versus sulfur on a uh, Yeah, the question is timing of, of the stabilizer. And I'll answer with the data that is the best opportunity to, to, to apply a stabilizer earlier in the season or later in the season in general. 
earlier in the season because when, we, when we're applying it to side dress applications like this, unless that rainfall happens for the nitrification, denitrification to happen, we're, we're basically protecting it very close to when the plant actually needs the nitrogen. It'd be smarter to apply the stabilizer earlier because you're trying to protect a weed and feed application for, you know, grand growth stage of V10 sometime in July. So, so protecting the earlier pounds earlier makes probably the most sense. The only, the trade-off though is 70-30, right? Most, most people are putting 30% of their nitrogen, um, you know, up to planting and then 70% side dress. And that's probably a majority of the guys that you're seeing here, that's all they do. You're only protecting 30% of your nitrogen at that point, but you probably don't need to protect the 70 as much, you know, given the normal weather conditions. But that's a great question. So, but so if, I, but if we're putting sulfur on, should we be putting sulfur on well, early or later? Where'd my agronomist go? <laughs> but, oh yeah, Mary, you had somebody. <laughs> what kind are you putting on? <laughs> but so that's a question, that's a good question. So get those timings right. We, to answer those questions, we really need, you know, information about what you're doing, what you can do, uh, what's feasible in your operation. So it's not a cut and dry, um, one answer fits all. But if you've got the question, come up and talk to us, um, Tyler, TJ, Danny, or myself. We can kind of go through those or um, work with your retailer on what options they can provide as well. And remember, there's two reasons that you're applying that sulfur for this for the stabilizing ability, but also because it, it makes your nitrogen, it, it, it's needed by the plant for, for the plant food requirement as well. So, yeah. It's, it, sulfur is, meat may box has the keys to the truck, right? Because it's so important to all of the, okay. I, I'm getting, I'm getting the hook. I'm getting the 